it was really a moment to again I guess think about what was important what I what I wanted to get out of my life what I wanted to spend my time doing so it's been a really valuable time I guess to be able to refocus and plan ahead uh, and actually just really appreciate where I am in the world I'm in a pretty amazing place and I'm incredibly grateful for it this is the deep in the weeds podcast I'm Anthony Huckstep. What does it mean to be a hospo lifer? It can mean obtaining a wealth of skills and experience and ability to travel, but for many, a career in hospitality has limited their work life balance. But for some, being a hospo lifer, it can mean you can find a job that adapts to the sort of lifestyle you want to live. Has this period of time allowed many in the industry the chance to find equilibrium? Bronwyn Cabord is a restaurant manager of De Fermier in Trentham, Victoria. Bronwyn, how are you going? I'm fantastic, thank you. I'm uh, very excited that today I get to do service without a mask on for the first time in many months, so I am that kid in the candy store today. Very excited. Wow, it's a, it's an amazing um, development and uh, Melbourne and Victoria has been on the most incredible um, and frightening ride for quite a quite a few months now. What, what's it feel like at the moment where you are? Um, f- well, exciting. It um, it feels really positive. Uh, I feel like we've been a bit spoilt being regional compared to all of our mates in the city. They've done an incredible job to get us to where we are now uh, in Victoria. So, it's it, we're feeling really positive and hopeful and um, looking forward to to what's ahead. We've been talking to a lot of people in the industry that have realised the lack of work-life balance in their lives and this period of time has shone a light on that. Can you tell us a bit about your working experience because you you worked that out a few years ago and tried to pull that together? Yes, certainly. Um, I, you know, having a restaurant that was all-consuming, um, there wasn't really a day off. I really got to the point of needing to find something where there was that balance. There was time spent with family and friends and and doing things that, that were really important to me. So I, I guess I, I kind of got lucky finding Annie and finding a job where, I mean, it may not be for everybody, but having a job that is lunches four days a week, a day that is – given to admin and you know preparing yourself for the week is pretty special and it's been able to give me the opportunity to to do things that I'm really passionate about and and spend time on um, loves other loves really can we talk about the lead up to that revelation because uh, your partner Rob was at key as the head chef at the time and you were running Mericoat in in Melbourne um what were the challenges involved in that? It was tough. It was tough um, seeing each other essentially once a fortnight. Um, we're so lucky the Sydney-Melbourne flying route is what it is. Uh, it was pretty quick getting backwards and forwards. But it's it's really hard when you're both um, – you know, deep in what you're doing, uh, in jobs that were all consuming and took all your energy. So we'd have to really concentrate when we, um, spent time together to, to make it about us and reconnecting every time. But, um, I think also we were, we were lucky that we were, I guess our relationship allowed us to both uh, follow jobs and have a career, you know, doing things that we were passionate about. We had the space and time to be able to do it. But, yeah, it was it was really tough. I think I did Maricote by myself for uh, two and a half years. I, and I just think without the incredible people that were around us in that restaurant, I wouldn't have been able to do it. I mean, I was incredibly lucky with that. So, you know, and Rob would sort of help from afar, but it was uh, – it was a little tough when he uh, obviously had a position that was in such an incredible restaurant that's really busy and changing all the time. Before Rob moved to Key back in the days when you sort of started Mericote, 
what sort of what did it take to pull together a business like that and the, the personal energy required? What sort of impact did it have on you guys? Um, it was it it was really intense. Um, we opened that business in two thousand and eleven uh, on a on a shoestring. We've sort of rubbed our pennies together. Um, we'd sort of got to the point we'd been um, managing other venues and. I think we sort of got to the point of, you know, maybe it's time to to do our own thing together. Um, I had done something in Sydney with a couple of friends. We uh, look personally; it was a it was a really intense time. We had just discovered that we were unable to have a family after waiting quite a period to find the right time. Uh, so we really probably threw ourselves into that business, um, throwing everything at it, making it all about the guests, trying to give them an experience that was, you know, what we really envisioned hospitality to be. So it was, we, we painted ourselves, we, uh, sanded chairs, we made, we made it happen with what we had. And it was, it was one of the, those experiences that, uh, we, we kind of, we worked really hard at, at creating a space that we were really proud of. So it was, it was, it was hard, but it was, it was really rewarding. It was, it was an experience that I think it, at the time we probably didn't look after each other as much as we needed to, but certainly once we sort of settled into it and we found our groove with the story we were, we were trying to tell and the experience we were giving, we, um, we were, yeah, we were proud of what we did. Can you tell us a bit about that restaurant because it was something different, a bit special for Melbourne? What, what were you doing there? It was a bit quirky. It had uh, animal napkin rings and it had a rickety old trolley, cheese trolley that we'd picked up for less than $100 at Bunnings and it trundled around and it didn't have a bar as such. It was really like walking into someone's living room It um, that we, we really wanted to remove that divide and just – you know, it's like coming in and having a big hug. So uh, Rob being Dutch, the food sort of was a bit tongue-in-cheek towards uh, things that he would eat in as a child, uh, his grandmother's um, pig's head soup, and he'd sort of elevate it to, to, you know, a more modern dining experience. But it really, yeah, it was an experience for people that had Dutch heritage that would try things they'd sort of heard about or they'd had as with their grandparents, I guess. But it um, it was also about wines from further afield that were maybe things people hadn't tried before. Uh, we're both big fans of beer, so I'd had a big beer list. But it was, yeah, it was, I think, one of those restaurants that you could only get away with if you don't have a backup really it was something that was financially just driven by us so if Rob wanted to get in some amazing product and it was totally ridiculous it didn't matter we just you know it we just made it work so yeah it was it was definitely I think um uh, what we saw as, you know, an experience for people to come and sort of be in our living room, try things they hadn't tried before and uh, get to know, I guess, what a little bit about what we're passionate about. Very early on in the series, I think around about episode four or five, we spoke to Annie Smithers and she sort of talked about the value and the importance of that work-life balance. You've got many friends in the industry. What are some of the issues that you see for hospitality workers in trying to obtain that? Oh, well, it's, I think the industry itself, you know, is predominantly driven by night services. So, you know, if you have a partner that isn't or fr friends that aren't in hospitality, it, it's hard to find the time to, to spend with them uh, and, you know, keep those friendships and relationships going and trying to find, I think also the having the tight days off that, that you can go to events and family celebrations and things like that. I think uh, it's, um, it's, it's really tough to find, find the balance of, in a job that can afford for you to have those times and those spend that time with family really. 
you describe your job as a unicorn job in the hospitality industry. How much have you changed personally in um, obtaining that sort of balance? Has it made a big difference to your life? Absolutely. Huge difference. It is literally the unicorn hospo job. I'm, I'm a very lucky girl. Um, it's, uh, it's the best. It, it's huge. It's the things that, you know, I mean, country life may, may not be for everybody, but, you know, I have a dog and cats and chickens and five acres to try and keep in some sort of respectable state. So it's, um, it's really, it's really been an experience unlike any other I've had in this industry. It's people also make the trip. It's a weekend away. It's, um, they're just coming into another world really, um, which is what, what Defermia feels like to me. It's, tiny it's intimate and you know we we spend a couple of hours together um while people enjoy the spoils of annie's garden and and have a beautiful lunch and and then i get to go home and and do other things like it's it's so weird it's fantastic (laughs) you've done many things in in your career but how did you first get interested in food and start in the hospitality sector i um grew up in in country victoria with parents that suggested a trade would be a good way to go because you'll always have a job. So food not being that important, I started uh, my chef's apprenticeship in the country uh, at the ripe old age of 16 um, and spent two years in the country before moving. I just decided it was time to hit, go to the big smoke and, and take on new adventures. So I, for some reason I decided Sydney was a better option than Melbourne. Um, and, uh, I'm not sure why. And then, uh, spent two years finishing my apprenticeship, um, working in ho- uh, a little seafood restaurant and then in hotels. Um, and then the opportunity, I was part of a group training network as an apprentice. I think my mum was sort of thought it was good as a, as an 18 year old to have a bit of guidance, um, and had won their apprentice of the year back in 1994 I think it was now and the opportunity arose to go to Japan Uh, it was the season before the Winter Olympics and they were very keen to have uh, foreigners come into the restaurant and the hotel uh, and help them acclimatize I guess to, to the experience that they were about to have so it was amazing as a I think I was almost 21 spending time in a kitchen, the only foreigner, couldn't speak a word of Japanese, um, learned to eat a bowl of ramen really quickly, um, <laughs> 15-minute lunch breaks. But it, it was such an amazing opportunity and I sort of spent two years um, time there and then also north of Tokyo. Uh, I <laughs> randomly ended up leaving hospo for a moment because it was really hard to sort of learn. Um, I think we've all seen Jiro Dreams of Sushi and it's true. You know, they they study for 10 years before they have the opportunity to go and um, do certain dishes. So it, I guess as a young younger chef it was kind of frustrating to not get those opportunities but um so I ended up teaching English to kinder kids for 12 months which was I don't even know how I fell into that but um it was it was great it was uh yeah I had an amazing experience with those children um and then headed off to London most most of us all thought that was the place to be um and spent I think it was two years uh, working in hotels. I met Rob in my first job there. Um, so we sort of spent a couple of years there. I was on a working holiday visa um, before we came back to Australia. Um, my, then I was cooking at Bathers Pavilion. That was my last cooking job. I had an amazing sommelier there, Sally Harper, who started to show me, show me wines and the way she communicated about it just sort of opened up a whole new world to me. So I actually left the kitchen. I ran the front of house, well, front, the front, the shop for the pastry chef that I worked for at Bathers. Uh, they opened up 
in Mossman and we, yeah, it was, uh, that was really great. That was actually a really good work-life balance there. I'd so I had four days on and three days off. And I think that was where the, the love of being with people and communicating with them and, and giving them experiences grew from. So I opened, opened up a restaurant with two friends. We sort of threw ourselves into that, a tiny little place, it had a terrible name called Alchemy 731. Uh, we just, <laughs> we didn't really think that one through, uh, but it was, it was, uh, it was fun. It was, it was the cheapest education I've ever had in regards to learning things about restaurants, front of house, um, and just industry mates that sort of banded together and helped us do it. It was, it was a great experience. Has your time in the back of house working as a chef helped you in the front of house now that you're a professional uh, restaurant manager? Absolutely. I think understanding, one, how dishes are constructed, the thought process between, between what goes on the plate, how elements are brought together is really important to be able when you talk, especially in an environment that I'm in now where you're talking about what's on the plate and where it's come from and the, and obviously choosing wine to go with it, uh, it, it certainly, it certainly helps the process for sure. Do you miss being in the kitchen? No, <laughs> no, definitely not. Definitely not. I was behind Annie's stove the other day and I was so claustrophobic. I was like, get me out of here. So no, I, I don't miss it, but I have a lot of respect for, for chefs for sure. What does it take to create great hospitality in the restaurant for the front of, in the front of house for for guests i think the ability to listen to a guest is so underrated i think uh, maybe covid has sort of brought this to a head as well but i think to that first couple of minutes or that first 30 seconds even it's the the catching someone's eye knowing that you see them that they know that you 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 know they're there that that you're there to look after them and inviting them in with a big smile and just listening to them when they're talking about what they want or whether it's a wine or if they're talking about things that they don't eat or it's just really listening to what they want and grasping it and and giving them the that the experience that they're looking for i think it's it's so important to um to listen to them and to take the, take them on a journey, really. You've worked uh, in a business with with Rob, your partner, but you also worked in different businesses in the hospitality sector. Are there pluses and minuses of of both for you? Yeah, I. It's funny when we when we sold Maricot, there was initial thought to find something bigger something with a bar and a dining room. I think we'd been at Bones in Paris back in you know, when it was open and and loved the, how those spaces work together. Um, but the, it's funny, I think certain people, I've, I've been thinking about it, some businesses suit people more than others. I'm definitely suited to a smaller intimate venue um, mates that are, need that big city buzz in a amazing fit out and and what that brings and and others that suit uh, you know a wine bar with you know giggles over the bar and sharing a glass or something I, I think um, yeah it's I think finding your place is actually really important and what suits you has it, has there been some challenges uh given that you both work in the industry and um, trying to find time for each other when, you know, the, the industry uh, requires so much energy and, and also so many hours. For sure. Yeah, it does. I mean, I feel like I've got it really easy now. So, but in the past, yeah, it's, um, it is hard to make sure you find that time for each other. I mean, one of our greatest loves is to, to be in a dining room and, and enjoy someone else's hospitality. So that would always be a really great opportunity for us to reconnect, talk about what's happening, plan for what was coming up. So, I th yeah, we made a very conscious effort, particularly I think once Rob went to Key um, to find that time to really you know, make sure, sure we had that time to connect. You mentioned at the top of the show how excited 
you are about not wearing a mask and the the developments that have been happening in in Melbourne and everything opening up. Um, do you think the the experiences of this year are going to change the Melbourne and Victorian dining landscape? Definitely. It's um, I've been thinking about it a lot recently. It's I feel what we've been through. I think as Victorians, we've certainly become closer. I think we're we're pretty damn proud of ourselves um, at the moment. Um, but I think on an industry level, it's a bit scary. I'm, I just think of, I see all the empty shops, um, you know, what's going to happen in six months time, uh, who's going to be around, you know, but maybe it's actually going to be a whole new chapter. You know, we might see these little things like what Maricote was, people able to live their dream because they can get into something, you know, without having to spend as much money. I mean, we couldn't afford, you know, to do what we did now. It's, you know, it's take, it costs a lot more to set, set up and open a, a business now. So I'm, I'm really, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that, that things will get better, um, that restaurants will be back on track. And, and I think it's exciting how people have been thinking about different ways to, to share their hospitality, you know, I think it's um, it's been really exciting to see what happens and and how people are looking at things differently. You manage to transition and find that balance, but it, it can be difficult for so many because there's so many um, different lifestyles and different people in the industry. But do you have some advice on how to make that transition and get better balance and equilibrium between work and, and home life? I think you have to – I think actually having a short – plan whether it's three years five years is a really good thing to do I think it's hard in hospitality but I think if you can think about where you want to be in three years time and it helps you plan those steps of how to get there um I I it's it's hard to find the right at the right thing but it's also, yeah, working out what's the most important thing to you. Uh, and I guess it, maybe it's getting older. I mean, I've just realised that I've been in the industry for 30 years next year, which is amazing. Um, <laughs> like, oh, God, how did I make it? So to be fair, it's taken me quite a long time to to work out the work-life balance. But I think you've really got to find something that enables you to have that bit of the time for other things. I mean, it took me this job really to to be able to have a balance between the two. So, um, yeah. You're a self-described hospo lifer. What do you love about the industry and and your place in it? Oh, it's it is the best. It make it's truly my happy place. I think of. Um, the conviviality at a table, that little buzz, it's like going to the best metal concert. It's oh, well, you know, might be classical if that's your thing, but it's uh, it's just the most incredible experience. I had a moment of it yesterday that oh, it just brings me complete joy. And then traveling through Europe, um, seeing family and then always visiting a new wine region and sitting with a winemaker who works his small plot of land by himself and we can't speak the same language but we're communicating over this incredible bottle of wine that he's made and its place in the world um it's it's something that is so unique to this industry that you you've never met you know he knows you sell his wine um but he's thrilled that you want to come and have an experience and see where he where he works so um it's it's the those moments that are so uniquely hospitality that I am I feel so lucky to have found the career that I did. Considering when I started, it was was kind of about having a job, not a career, and it's been an incredible career to me. We've seen a, a lot of interest in regional dining and people travelling a lot because they can't go overseas. What sort of impact has Victorian um, society opening up? had on De Fermier and, and future sort of bookings? Um, it, um, it was interesting with the lockdowns. We had a period 
uh, where there was just regional diners that were allowed. And I think that was lovely for people located around us that were never able to get in because the restaurant is always full. Uh, so it was really wonderful to be able to welcome them in and, and have them enjoy our hospitality. So we've probably had, I'd say, three, four weeks. It all seems like a bit of a blur now since we've been able to welcome Melbourne back in. And it's it's been really it's been really special. We've um, it's just like welcoming old friends back. So it's it's great to see things opening up. It's great to see people out in the country again. Uh, we've you know there's lots of people talking about coming from interstate and dying to get back, which is great. So yeah, hopefully um, moving forward, we we'll be welcoming friends from all over again, which will be fantastic. During this year, a lot of people have talked how the circumstances have changed their perspective on things. You had that big shift a couple of years ago, but has this year changed you? Yeah, it it really has. I think I really had a bit of a tough time during the first lockdown. I think it was the whole, we had no idea when we were going to open again. I think the initial conversations you know what we would see on the news was that it was September October we didn't really know and I felt lost I couldn't work out my place in it all where I was going to be how I just wanted to work because I don't really see it as work I genuinely love what I get to do every day it does it really does bring me complete joy so I yeah, it was a, it was really a moment to again, I guess, think about what was important, what I what I wanted to get out of my life, what I wanted to spend my time doing. So, it's been a really valuable time, I guess, to be able to refocus and plan ahead, uh, and actually just really appreciate where I am in the world. I'm in a pretty amazing place, and I'm incredibly grateful for it. You mentioned about trying to get a three to five year plan in place to, to not only give you stability, but also a chance to obtain that sort of equilibrium and work-life balance. What's what's the plan for you in the next three to five years? Well, I don't really plan on going anywhere uh, work-wise for the foreseeable future because I am so happy. But I think um, I think I what I want to do is make sure that I do have this continue this balance, uh, whether or not I mean who knows maybe we'll end up opening something again. Not that I'm planning on it, but I think by um, doing what I'm doing, opportunities will come, and I think I'm lucky that I get to do what I do pretty much as I wish. So um, I'm excited to just see how how things develop, I guess. I mean, Rob's just about to open a a new thing. So it's all sort of all about him right now, but I'm thoroughly enjoying my um, country existence. So um, spending more time at home and doing things there, I think. You've mentioned quite a few times how much you love the role that you have now, and it's out in Trentham at Defermier. What's so special about that region and that restaurant? The region's incredible. Uh, it's we we get the coldest winters. Uh, there's some fantastic little producers around us that we're so lucky to work with, um, and there's a really lovely hospitality community. I mean, Dalesford itself is such a, a hub for tourists as as Trentham is. It's you know only sort of just over an hour from the city. Um, and there's a really lovely community uh, of hospitality people and it's we sort of all support each other and it's it's great um yeah i it's yeah it's a really special part of the world that i probably spent a little bit of time in as a child but growing up in northeast victoria um it was just as yeah just just visiting for holidays but it's uh, i i love what's happening here and we've got you know, there's saffron growing down the road and you know there's truffles the other side of Dalesford um, there's there's lots of exciting things around here fantastic wine producers yeah we're very spoiled well we're fast approaching the end of 2020 and a lot of people are glad to see the back of it what what are you most looking forward to in 2021 mm. Well, I, I'd be honest, I would love to be going to Europe. I don't know if that's going to happen, but 
Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing friends and family that I haven't had the time to see this year, uh, particularly in other states. Uh, That's something I'm so excited about. Well, Bronwyn, we've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds and you also gave us a little clue. We're very interested to see what Rob's up to now too. We might give him a call and do a bit of a catch up with him. Um, We've loved hearing your story on Deep in the Weeds. Uh, Please keep in touch and uh, we'll talk again soon. Thank you so much. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospital community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.